This is too high up. I think we are live. Welcome to the Horasis um, panel on the arts, decolonizing Western narratives of art. My name is Ethan Cohen. I'm a gallerist from New York City. Uh, I'm here with a very distinguished panel and um, I'm very pleased that we're here. One of our panelists will join us in a few minutes. Uh, she's having a few technical difficulties getting into the um, Horace platform, but we're gonna begin our um, talk now. I wanted to introduce each of the artists here um, and give a short introduction. Uh, Mina Chun uh, on the screen here from the Maryland Institute College of Art, um, uh, Annie Buckley, um, uh, from the Institute of Arts, uh, San Diego State University, uh, Suzanne Bruegel, um, artist uh, based in New York City, um, and then Vinny Bagwell, who is a sculptor, American sculptor, uh, based, I think, also uh, here in New York, up uh, in New York, greater area. Oh, and Vinny's here. Great. Hi, so I see so Great, Vinny. Yay. Welcome to our discussion. I'm just giving a short introduction uh, to each of the panels, including yourself. And um, basically the topic today is uh, the arts, decolonizing Western narratives uh, of art. Um, and we're gonna discuss what it means, what it means to all of us and what's happening in art today. And let me first give a short introduction here. Um, um, Vinnie Bagwell is an American sculptor, a representational figurative artist Vinnie uses traditional uh, bas relief techniques and visual narratives to expand her storytelling. She casts in bronze and bronze resin. She has won numerous public art commissions and awards around the United States. She was born in Yonkers. We have two, two women on our panel today. Suzanne, you'll see in a second, is also from Yonkers. Uh, uh, Vinnie uh, grew up in the town of Greensburg. Greensburg. She displayed a remarkable gift of drawing at an early age and uh, developed a passion for painting in high school. You're a Morgan State University graduate, alumna, um, and you are an untutored artist and began sculpting in 1993. Um, you've uh, co-authored a book titled A Study of African-American Life in Yonkers from the Turn of the Century with Harold um, Essenson in 1990. Is that right, Essenson? Sanison. And Sanison, thank you. Um, in the mid 90s, and uh, many followed her compelling articles in the weekly column for Garnet Suburban Newspapers, The Herald Statesman. Um, you've also, uh, you're a contributing writer for the Harlem Times. Thank you, Vinny. Um, and Buckley um, uh, is the Director, Institute of Arts, Humanities, and Social Justice, San Diego State University. Uh, Annie Buckley is a multidisciplinary artist, writer, curator with an emphasis on art and social justice, and you're the founder and director of the Prison Arts Collective, a statewide program dedicating to expanding access to the transformative power of arts to incarcerated people. Um, Professor Buckley joined the San Diego State University as director of the School of Art Design in summer of 2019, and is thrilled to collaborate with faculty, students, and staff in the school. Uh, she joins uh, San Diego, um, uh, SDSU from uh, San, San, Bar uh, San Bardino, where she began in 2011 as an assistant professor of visual studies and ultimately gained tenure and then promotion to full professor. Um, prior to this, Professor Buckley taught at UCLA Graduate School of Education um, and Teacher Education Program. So thank you, Annie. Um, Suzanne Bruegel. Suzanne Bruegel is a white artist who works um, uh, who makes work and addresses whiteness and the structural racism, subject matter that she has dealt with for more than 15 years. Um, her work is grounded in autobiography, having grown up in Yonkers, New York, um, a city that was sued by the federal government in the 1980s to undo a pattern of intentional segregation in schools and housing. Um, Suzanne grew up uh, on a street that was a border between predominantly black school district and predominantly white school district. Being a white student in a predominantly black elementary school was a blessing that anchored her anti-racist worldview. Um, your multidisciplinary approach to art making spans 2D, 3D, and public participatory works. She uses prosaic objects 
as art materials in her quest to disrupt the status quo of structural racism. You use everyday objects such as office supplies and health and beauty products that are embedded with latent social meanings. Um, these mass-produced consumer goods cross over uh, into our intimate daily lives, and we use them in our homes, on our bodies, and our workplaces. So thank you, Sam. We're interested in hearing more about your art practice. Each of these artists will give, after I give my initial introduction, um, a short introduction to their own art practice and the subject of today's topic. Um, the last artist I will introduce now is Mina Chun. Um, Mina is a PhD MFA um, holder. She's a Korean American global new media artist, scholar, and educator who divides her times, uh, time between Korea and the United States. Mina is the associate dean um, uh, uh, of the Maryland Institute College of Art and is an artist in, with whom I have collaborated for more than 10 years uh, in my gallery. Uh, very honored to work with her. Um, Mina Chun has exhibited her political pop, art known as polypop, internationally and draws inspiration from global media and popular culture to produce work that intersects po politics and pop art in evocative ways. While she creates work that ranges in medium from news media, video, installation, performance, public projects to traditional media of painting and sculptures, the content of the work um, is in historic alignment to appropriation art and global activism art. She's a global activist. She is a, um, actually, she, she, you're an American artist, or you're actually a Korean artist living in America who has taken on a persona as a North Korean artist, your alter ego, correct? AKA Kim Il Sun. So you're trying to bring awareness to the issues between North and South Korea. Um, through yourself. Um, in particular, Mina Chun has worked on North Korean awareness and global peace projects since 2004. Uh, and while assuming different artistic pseudonyms for the past 20 years, such as Mina Lisa 1000, M1000, J Sun, um, Mina, Mina Chun's latest avatar and alter ego is a North Korean artist named Kim Il Sun, maybe the child of Kim Il Sung. Um, a power woman, single mother of two beautiful children. Um, and you've made your first public appearance at the Pulse Art, Art Fair in 2013 with my gallery. <laughs> that was exciting. In full military garb from North Korea. Um, Mina Chun states, as a Korean, the idea of having two artistic identities, a South Korean Mina Chun and a North Korean Kim Il Sun, is an obvious reflection on the country's state of being divided. It makes all the sense in the world that if a country is split, so should the artist in practice, a sweet revolution. So I will start our discussion today. Uh, Mina, why don't you start as a short uh, two to five minute introduction to your art practice. Then I would like to then give uh, Susan Bruegel, Anne Buckley, Vinnie Bagwell a sh uh, each a, a moment of introduction and then would actually attack the um, uh, topic of today's discussion, which I think I should probably read right now. Um, the topic of discussion, the, the first question that we're really addressing the history of art has long been dominated by the inescapable shadow of colonization, uh, where art paid tribute to Western colonial tradition and was hailed supreme by elites. How to enter a new chapter of appreciation for decolonizing identity in non-Western art, reflecting the diversity of each artist's own character? What would it mean to make space for a different kind of artistic expression? So this is the topic that we'll begin with, and then I'm, each, each of your own artistic practices will obviously lead to certain questions. I welcome you to ask questions, um, and if there are questions from the audience who would like to ask a question, they can raise their hand, type in there, and I can read their questions, and I can then share them with the panel today. So Mina, why don't you start us off? Mina Chun, PhD, uh, uh, Associate Dean of the Maryland Institute College of Art. Thank you so much, Ethan. Um, thanks to Frank, Jürgen, Richter, and yourself for inviting me to this panel and international convening. And for the elaborate introduction to my practice, 
here is my preamble. It's a little bit um, of a different focus than just looking at my art process. I'd like to contemplate on some fundamentals related to the topic of decolonizing Western narratives of art. I'm reflecting on what is the Western narrative of art and how is it being decolonized? Coming from the perspective of a practicing contemporary artist, Asian female artist, Korean artist, new media artist, educator, and administrator. Some of the ideas I have right now are tied to art education in that art students are the future. So I'm thinking about them. I hope in sincerity that they will be empowered to reshape the colonial narratives and the problematics of the art world and world in general. As it stands, art collection invests on the past, but not the future. What I mean by this is that the value of art is based on pre-identified structures designated for a small number of artists or groups or trends or types and can marginalize a whole lot of other creatives, talents and labors of the artistic community at large. The art world still relies on recreating generic successful artist types. As much as Madonna begets Britney begets Miley, Warhol begets Coons and Kostabi begets Marikami. Mid-career contemporary artists in practice work and navigate through a myriad of structural contradictions trying to attain success. We work in a field and industry that is codified by pre-existing art world language and behavior relying on the genius artist. This genius artist narrative is one existing trope of the colonial narrative that is born through Western thought and modern art, but it still holds sustaining power in every stroke, line, color, gesture, expression, and form that manifests an ongoing internal dialogue about the inherent qualities of the medium and reifies the objecthood of art. While the art object created from a private studio works to respond to life events in some respects, it holds artistic authority by being aloof from society. At the consumer's end, for elites and critics, the bourgeoisie's taste still plays a part in determining what constitutes good art, timely art, relevant art, surrounding the theme of the genius artist, his gifted hands, and the original piece of work created thereof. On to my next point. The other colonial narrative of art making is that of originality. We're all copying and reapplying, recombining, integrating, reproducing, and this mode of sharing abundantly and hopefully appropriately takes away the value of the original work of art. But isn't that okay? With transnational and transgenerational lineage of the human race, might we not be okay with joint authorship that doesn't not reduce good. and individuate artists as a single creator? With skill sharing and knowledge sharing made widely available, why are we fixated in artistic ownership? In today's more complex world where colonial racism is exposed at every level of society, artists do take on an activist mindset. They are citizens first while being artists still and rescripting the process of art making, demystifying the romance and aura of the object and placing the subject of artists as human beings in the forefront, capable of compassion, empathy and community. And rather than art material, the concern becomes outfacing life as material, artist conscience as medium. But how do we decolonize the imperial impetus for creation itself? If the creation is a single act, we challenge it with multiple processes. If it is for the individual, we collaborate with community. If the work is for sale, we make sure there is a message to be said. I can't say for sure that there is no Western in non-Western art, but there is always a response about Western art by the non-Westerner. As a Korean artist, I was told I should resort to making more abstract smart art, 
rather than my political pop art. During the pandemic, my career took on a life of its own. I became a filler for the void of content and digital sphere. There was heavy reliance on artists to be content creators and artists with the message became good sound bites for podcasts and other forms of streaming. Through online interactivity and virtual experiences, my art de- as my art deliverables, a piece of me was shared and my diversity stored on digital clouds. So where does the future lie for our global citizens, future art students? I wonder if investment in education, yes, we're back here again, may have the same currency and investment worthy value than a piece of art. Thank you. Here, thank you, Mina. Um, I'd like to um, um, invite then Vinny to give a bit, a bit, two to five minutes, short or better, so we can get through this and maybe get to more questions. But I want to hear from each of you. So if you could just give us a short introduction, that'd be fantastic. So Vinny, do you, can I give you the floor? Yeah, hold on. Here we go. Vinny, yeah. can you hear Yeah. Am I unmuted? You're unmuted. good. Ready to talk? Yes. Vinnie Bagwell. Oh, we just lost her. Hold on. I think she went off. Why don't we then, we'll come back to Vinny. Why don't we, um, actually, Annie, um, Annie Buckley, um, Director, Institute of Arts, Humanities, and Social Justice, San Diego State University. Why don't you give your um, short introduction to your art practice, and then we'll come back to uh, uh, Vinny. Sure. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, Vinny's back. Do you want to go ahead? To Vinny? I don't know what happened. I was trying to share my presentation. Um, I've not worked on this platform before. And when I went to hit the share button, I zapped out. So yeah, maybe better is if we just speak it. And what we can do is um, maybe my colleague, uh, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Laura or Stephen can help us figure out how we can share your screen. But I think what great is why don't you verbally share what you do and then the audience can actually google each of us uh and our art practices to if we want to see actually see the artwork i think that might be simpler not a problem so as a public artist uh, i am a steward of this nation's memory and so um you know what i want to talk about a little bit is that my style is defined by candid portraiture and i use bar relief techniques um, in non-traditional ways, a lot of people think that it's kind of hard to do. But for me, it's something that um, works very wonderfully. And the reason why I like to use it is because I can expand the narrative to inform the viewer. <clears throat> and so it's very interesting. You know, I've learned over the years, you know, particularly through the feedback that I get through social media, that my subjects have souls that speak to the viewer. And, of course, they're meant to be engaging. So, uh, again, it's, it's not enough for me to just capture your eye. You know, I want to hold your eye and I want to engage you. So in that uh, line, I use civic engagement. It's a keystone to my practice. I invite folks into my studio, um, you know, for parties and previews and things like that. But also, too, I have workshops for students, um, five through K, college students, and we explore civility and tolerance. And you know, the idea is to foster dialogue about racial equity. And so my goal is to design truly memorable places um, you know, where inspiration and innovation converge. I want to create places that people haven't seen before. And so um, the fun thing now is that racial democracy calls for replacing offensive public artworks to acknowledge the contributions of African-Americans and to bring dignity to the memory of enslaved Africans and to elevate the culture, you know, generally of marginalized people. And so, you know, I find that storytelling through public art is one of the most powerful ways to preserve history for marginalized people of color. And, you know, the joy for me is that my artwork helps to balance the American narrative. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful, it's wonderful. Thank you for um, sharing with us uh, uh, your art practice and we'll come back to that. Um, Annie Buckley, why don't you give an introduction to your art practice? Sure. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, so, yeah, so my so I'm a multidisciplinary artist and writer and curator and educator and administrator. So similar hybrid titles, as as Mina mentioned. And um, 
I've worked uh, initially in like photo and text, and I also work with art criticism and curation. So I work in a variety of media. And I think the main thing I've always noticed is how that confounds people and how much they want to say you're this and you're that. And I've had people tell me like, well, you can't possibly do both of those things. And I think that a lot of that's changing. And I think that's really good. But that kind of linear thinking, I think is one of the many threads that needs to be untangled in this bigger process of decolonizing art, because there's this presumption that Art, it, art and artist is a very particular thing. And that particular thing, if you unpack it, has to do with a Western white patriarchal lens. And so when you're anything other than that, you know, and obviously working in different me is sort of the least important of those because being a person of color or being, um, you know, of a different gender or what have you would be more complicated. But as soon as it varies from that, then all of a sudden it's, um, it has to be explained or codified as a woman artist or a black artist or because it's not that norm. And I think that's like the most important thing that needs to be untangled. So um, I, I've worked a lot for a long time. I worked as an art writer and it was really important to me to write for, I think that I realized really quickly how much power structures define the art world. And so I did write for a long time for Art Forum and Art in America. And my goal was to bring in artists who are not regularly acknowledged in those spaces. But then at the same time, I wanted to write for like an airline magazine, Huffington Post, like places that maybe don't have a kind of a critical art voice and bring that to those spaces. So I think it, I've always been interested in just sort of bridging divides in both my art, um, which is participatory and text and image, as well as my writing. And then in more recent, like the past, um, uh, for like the past 25 years, I've worked in education and my goal has always been to work in public education because I wanted to um, just um, expand access to, uh, well, I'm just going to focus on the arts because that's what we're talking about, but just to expand access to the arts to people and communities who didn't necessarily have the arts because that's like the first thing that's cut in schools in areas that are dealing with poverty, it's always the first thing that's cut. And so children are growing up without access to creativity, problem solving, self-expression, joy, healing, like the kinds of things that we know and that research shows us that the arts provide and instead are having to perhaps find that in alternative ways or just not have it at all. So that's what I've been mostly focused on in my education career for many years. And for the past, um, you know, 10 years or so have had the really um, good fortune and amazing experience to be able to do that specifically with people who are currently incarcerated, which is, um, as we know, the most isolated um, amongst our population, as well as vastly disproportionately um, people of color and people in poverty. And so to be able to bring all of those things that the arts do, the kinds of things I mentioned earlier, imagination, empowerment, healing, um, self-expression to a population that's really cut off from that has been a really eye-opening experience. And so I can speak more about that in relationship to the topic a little later, but that's a little bit about my work. We can't hear. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for your introduction. That was fantastic, Annie. And um, you are the director of, and founder of the Prisons Art Collective, as I mentioned. Um, so we'll come back to that. And this idea of uh, decolonizing the art world, as I'd say the topic, maybe the first thing we're going to all can share and attack and try to take apart a little bit. Um, Suzanne Bruegel. Uh, artist, um, would you give an introduction to your art practice, please? Yes. Uh, this is saying I'm unmuted, right? This is you're you're unmuted. Yeah. Okay. It was asking me. Um, yes. Hi. Um, Welcome. I I wanted to do work addressing race when I was doing my MFA at Hunter College around. I was forming this work around 2002, 2001, 2002 was when I was, I really got into it. And I know, I know I wanted to enter the conversation of race and my own whiteness 
because white people are racialized too, but it's rarely spoken about. It's spoken about a bit more now, but in 2001, 2002, less so. And um, I had entered Hunter through ceramics. And at first I was trying to, you know, touch on the subject matter very figuratively and it just wasn't working. Although an important step was just actually saying it and like showing the work to another professor and talking about it. That was a big step. My heart was beating really fast. Can I talk about race? Because, you know, you call it almost expected, almost expected to talk race in their work. Whereas white people, it was like the opposite. It was like this pencil thing. And I feel like one when I talk about colonization, I have racism. And I feel that white people can you all hear are us? racist and we have to talk can you about hear that. Really? Can you hear? Yeah, hold on. Um, actually, can you hear me? Suzanne, if you could speak a little bit. Yeah, could you speak a little slower and if, stand up a little bit so we can see you, Bor? And then <clears throat> speak slowly. And there was some okay. technical issue with the uh, system right now. Um, I think we're okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you hear me I'm now? Unmute. Go ahead. Let me hear you, Suzanne. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so tell I us found about your art that. Practice. Yeah. So I so I started. The change happened for me when I stopped. I, I changed materials and I started to use everyday objects as art materials, the stuff that was around me in my everyday life. Band-Aids are referencing skin color, soap, ivory soap. You know, the history of soap is, is very uh, racialized. A advertising of soap in this country is very racist. So I use everyday objects to make primarily sculptures, but I walk, I, I kind of work across uh, disciplines. I sometimes do interactive and performative work as well. And, um, my, so my, it led my my thesis studies aside from you know making my work led me to also be involved with anti racist. I learned that there are white anti racist organizers, which led me to do the Undoing Racism workshop run by the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, and um, a group of uh, three black artists affiliated with the People's Institute or using that as a foundation created this anti-racist arts group that I'm a member of. It's called uh, Acre Artists Co-Creating Real Equity. And um, it's founded by Maria Bauman, Sarita Covington, and Nathan Trice. I'm very grateful to them. It's it's Black-led. It's a multiracial group, but it's it's Black-led, Black-founded. And um, Acre came up with a platform that anyone can use to... To, if they're interested in decolonizing the art world, I, I'm actually you can actually Google it. I just wanted to make sure it got seen. It's um artists co-creating real equity platform. If you just Google it, it, it touches on six points uh, in the arts: education, funding, media coverage, casting, curation, and space. Great. So, so. Yeah, that's an important, I would say being a part of Acre is an important part of my practice. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in fact, you you explained to me when we had a conversation yesterday, how you found when you're looking at mundane everyday objects like soap, there were mm -hmm. a vast majority of soaps focused just for white uh, consumers. And there was one, what did you t tell me more about that? Oh yeah, this was ban this was band aids actually band aids. Um, this was a, when my work sort of gelled with my idea for the first time when I, when I was doing my MFA at Hunter. I uh, it started as a very conceptual product project. Um, I wanted to map every shade of band aid, every skin shade of band aid for sale within uh, New York's African burial grounds in Lower Manhattan. And I took a 40 acre site because, you know, 40 acres is very significant as far as the history of slavery in this country and racism. And within that 40 acres, I found 20, uh, I found 23 shades of skin color band-aids. 22 shades were geared towards light skin. And then to my surprise, a 99 cent store 
had one shade of a, disc, a discontinued product that was made for darker skin tone called Ebonade Band-Aids. And out of the, so, so I took the inventory of Band-Aids that I found, and then I made a wall sculpture out of them. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Thank well, thank you very much, uh, Suzanne Bruegel. Each of your art practices are fascinating. They all deal with um, this decolonization, the opening up of the art world. Um, <clears throat> in fact, uh, Suzanne had mentioned, Suzanne Bruegel had said, uh, said to me, there's a question, how can someone watching today help to decolonize the field of art right now? And I think that all of us in our lifetime, uh, of my 30 years in the art world, I have seen there's basic, a decolonization, uh, greater awareness come, coming to more people with growing. The, uh, the excitement of right now African-American art, the focus on African-American art, the, the excitement now of African art from contempt of Africa now in the art market. Um, but it, what's interesting, it even brings back years ago when I began my art career, <clears throat> um, there was an artist, Onkawara, the Japanese artist, who is one of the greatest um, conceptualist, minimalist um, uh, artists in the field. He actually would not participate in any exhibition that called him a Japanese artist. He refused for that identity. He was an artist. And it really brings the thing in mind where, you know, Picasso, was he, was he Japanese? Was he French? Was he, what was he, was he Spanish? Was he Russian? It really doesn't matter. So I think that, you know, are you a man? Are you a woman? Are you black? Are you Asian? Are you Hispanic? It really, what matters to most, to us in the art world really is what you make, your ideas. And I think that uh, I have seen when I began my career as specializing in Chinese art, there were no galleries interested in Chinese art. F a few galleries. There are a few galleries interested in African American art. And I think that over the last 35 years, the world has changed. The world, and I think, and I think even today, the testament, we have four brilliant women on the panel. Um, uh, who are talking about decolonization and, you know, it is, it is your time. So let's, let's, I'd love you guys, love ladies to uh, colleagues to share your thoughts. Anyone who would like to start? I could, oh, am I me? I could offer um, a couple of, of thoughts in response to that, just because you just said that about us being a panel of, of, um, of women artists i'm i'm not i don't know if everyone identifies a female but based on what you said i'm assuming that we do so um or, or artists so, yeah, yeah yeah exactly we're we're just, <laughs> yeah, Basically, just, here we are with five creative people um and i don't want to deny my own gender i am a man uh and i think the fact is though you know when i look at mina chun's art or i think of uh actually you know, Vinny's artwork um or um, Annie's, or I'm really looking at your artwork. I'm not looking at your gender. So I think that's really interesting. And what I wanted to share, and and, and people probably already know this statistic, but of the 18, there was like several studies done. And for example, of 18 prominent art museums in the U.S., 87% of the works in those museums are created by men. And so that's specifically gender as opposed to racial identities, which is also really important, as well as um, 13.7% of the living artists in galleries in, in North America and Europe are women. So that is a very low percentage. So I actually think the idea that it doesn't matter is beautiful in a utopian world. But in the world that we live in, I think that the gender, the, the racial identity, the um, or the, you know, the race, the ethnic identity, all of those things, whether free or not free, you know, whether having abilities or differently abled, they matter if the artist wants to put them forward, right? Like I would never put an identity on someone and in, in writing about them or talking about them or looking at their work. But for artists that choose to put that forward, I think it does matter for reasons like that statistic. And there is sort of this general idea of art as like going back to that idea of of a male 
why Western is has for many years been the norm throughout our history, such that all of those who are not in that category fall into an other. Like I've always disliked that idea of outsider artists, because it's like, well, outside of what? Why is that outside? Why is that just not another beautiful art form? So I think it's like dismantling that presumption. So I would say the main thing that people should do, like to answer that question, is to look at our own individual biases that we have and try to disavow them in looking at and understanding art and then more broadly for the art world to just really open up the ideas of what is art and what is an artist because it I I feel based on like that statistic and many others when we look at art throughout the world it does fall to a certain like norm I was able to listen to a speech um a lecture just the other night by um Nobel laureate Wale Shoyenka from Nigeria and he was speaking about the idea of language and how English is, it made me think a lot about English as the default language of like the art market and the art world and how even just that right there is already this norm that then puts everything else into like another category. So I think for people to just like look at and challenge their own assumptions might help us to change the whole and get to that utopian space where, yeah, it really doesn't matter. I'd like to um, add a little bit more to that, if that's okay. You know, um, when it comes to being an Asian artist, I, it's really quite different. And the expectation of, um, I guess, broadcasting is a weird way of putting it, but identifying uh, nationally uh, within Asian sort of uh, you know, platform or Asian spaces, Asian art world spaces versus uh, what it means to be a kind of, a, you know, a specific national representative um, artist, you know, on an international stage or an American stage. Um, I think the discussions kind of slightly does change. I mean, within Northeast Asian sort of art spaces, you know, um, it is, you know, the kind of conversations that do go on is nuanced in a way that can't be completely, you know, um, easily translatable into, you know, what is relevant and, you know, what kind of um, things are sort of contested at the, at the moment and very kind of specific to the regions um, and its locality. At the same time, uh, you do see a lot of Asian artists, you know, engaging in the discourse that is, you know, centered on um, the problems and challenges of race relations that is specific to the United States with the language, not only English, but with the kind of language that can, uh, you know, be better communicated. And if I were to adopt some of the languages that I learn, you know, from you know, the academic discourse and world and apply it to the things that go on in my own country and, you know, with the neighboring nations between Korea, China and Japan, for example, you know, th there's rampant racism amongst neighboring Asian countries. And, and a lot of people don't really kind of recognize that here. And it's uh, shown in the way in which, um, you know, a physic physiognomy is used for uh, the, you know, what constitutes beauty, the way in which, uh, you know, there's the pure beauty versus the characterized Western, you know, a facial beauty that is uh, kind of, that is uh, used between different uh, Asian nations categorically. And I say this is just as a way to say that, um, as a Korean artist, I think all Korean artists, whether or not they're representing their Koreanness or Korean identity or utilizing Korean issues in the forefront, you know, to dialogue in the art spaces, they are in many ways dismantling the the problems of the histories of the world uh, power structures. They are in so many ways as Koreans just being out there. They are decolonizing uh, the you know, the kind of lineage of having been 
through a process of colonial uh, Japanese imperialism and uh, the ramifications post that American imperialism splitting of the country. And so therefore, even if they don't represent, you know, themselves as Koreans, they are actually in the process of decolonizing and doing the work for who they are. I, I believe that. Yeah. Hi there. Okay. Um, one of the things that I, I want to bring to attention, just to kind of address what you just said, um, it's a little different between curatorial art and public art. Um, we experience similar things, but there's a lot of differences. Um, and so one of the things that I want to bring to your attention is that, yeah, um, if you're talking about representational figurative art in America, uh, you're talking about something like maybe 5,600 and change sculptures nationwide. Um, of those sculptures, less than 5% are done by women and less than that are done by people of color. So now that we have Black Lives Matter and, you know, we are now seeing this trend towards inclusiveness um, of subject matter, there's still a concern that it's really, really hard for minorities to get in the public art arena because it is a white patriarch arena, because the, uh, the commissions are high. Uh, you you kind of need one to get one. How do you get one if you don't have one? Um, and so it makes it really, really hard for the new people to get into the arena, unless they're really extraordinarily talented and a municipality or a foundation or a school or whomever, um, wants to take a crapshoot on somebody new, um, it's gonna make it really, really hard to change the voice of the artist in the public art arena because you have all these restraints. That's, that's something that I would like to just simply um, kind of state there because uh, you know, in the last couple of years, you know, folks like Americans for the Arts, you know, the New York Times, Art Forum, they're calling me, asking me questions and I'm like, it's not gonna be easy to make the transition from where we are to where we should be because of the way that the public art arena is set up. Can you hear you? Sorry, here we I'm gonna I'm unmute everyone here. Okay. Um, can you unmute everyone, please? Um, what's interesting, listening to each of your art practices and we're, we're, we're really feeling, at least I'm noticing, there is this huge system that is a racist or it's basically whatever was done many, many years ago is still in place. And it is influencing every possible aspect of our society. When Suze, um, Suzanne's talking about, you know, soap or Band-Aids, you know, 99% of it is geared toward white people as opposed to minorities, um, Hispanics or, you know, uh, blacks or uh, Asian. Um, and then this idea that, um, you know, in public art, that's fascinating. 5,600 sculptures nationwide, only 5% are by women and less by um, minorities, blacks, etc. That's outrageous. So, I mean, when you think of, uh, I think of the Gorilla Girls, you know, you know, from the, you know, earlier, you know, our era, um, fighting, making us all aware that MoMA, the Met, the Whitney, most public museums have so few women included, mostly men. Um, I think that art groups, uh, we are all now trying to evolve, become more aware. Uh, and I think that even the, um, as an Asian artist in America, 30 years ago, there were so few opportunities if you were an Asian artist to get into a major gallery in New York. Same with a um, artist of color. Um, and, um, now the world has changed. It's a totally new uh, opportunity. Today, if you are a woman, if you are of uh, a minority, uh, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, whatever, gallerists are going to give you the time of day. You have an opportunity. Whereas 30 years ago, 20 years ago, forget it. If you weren't a German or British artist or American male, it was difficult to get in those doors. So I think that um, there are many things that we are we take for granted that are around us that um, are keeping, 
you know, laissez-faire, right? And I think that unless we are aware by artists uh, who make us aware, like your art practices, um, we will not evolve. And that's great. So, uh, you know, power to you. One other thing that I, I want to bring to your attention, too, that I think is important is I think leadership um, is important. Um, I'm in New York, and um, I want to say that in 2020, uh, Mayor Cuomo made those of us that are working on women sculptures uh, essential workers. So, for instance, I was working on Sojourner Truth for Walkway Over the Hudson. Uh, Meredith Bergman was working on uh, the Monumental Women for Central Park. He made us essential workers so that we could finish our work in time, on time, for, you know, the 100th anniversary of the women's suffrage. And, you know, that was important. Um, the other thing that the state of New York decided around about the same time was to put more uh, women and minorities in the state parks. And so, for instance, um, my Sojourn Troop was, was one of the first, you know, at the walkway over the Hudson. Um, they just announced the, announced the renaming of a park in Kingston, 508 acres after Sojourner Truth. Um, and then I'm, I just got a, an email. There's like two more calls coming for women. So New York State being, uh, you know, well, frankly, New York City is kind of like the mecca for the art world. Um, it's nice that we're leading uh, an example of how you can make changes in art and public places to be more inclusive. So I, I, I want to say kudos to the state of New York um, for that. I'm doing Harriet Tubman, um, you know, for Niagara Falls. And so there's definitely a focus, you know, for the state of New York in terms of trying to figure out visible and practical remedies for this problem. So kudos to, to my home state. Well, thank you. I, I just bring a quick note. I was going to send you all a note. Our session now uh, is no longer live. Um, and I think that it was a short 45 minutes. Um, uh, oh, I, oh, actually, I think we know. Actually, I think we are live. Our, our followers are still with us who, who would like to stay up with us. But I think that as a, on the schedule, our schedule session has a lot. Um, and so we can stay on for a few more minutes. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you, uh, maybe a short little um, uh, golden nugget of your thinking just from today. I think we, it's been short, uh, but it's been very uh, uh, eye-opening for me. Um, I even have an artwork behind me here by Jeffrey Spencer Hargrave, who's a uh, African-American artist here in New York City, and it's called Afro Matisse. And what's so interesting about Jeffrey's work, he's trying to um, put blacks back into the history of art where they should be, and in fact, or have never been given credit. And what's so interesting in this uh, sort of my own journey with Jeffrey's work is he loves Matisse. And what's so interesting, Matisse was so inspired by African tribal sculpture, African artists who were sculpting that Matisse was looking for uh, understanding how to make that s more simple line, that more beautiful um, concept. And I think that Matisse, his work, has so much African influence, not just Picasso, not just Brock or Leger. And so this is, from my own personal experience as a collector, as a curator, I'm just like, uh, uh, there was a wonderful curator, William Rubin, who did the show that was somewhat controversial, but also eye-opening, called Primitivism 35 years ago at MoMA, that actually showed the influence of African art on every great modernist uh, artist uh, from 1907 onward. Um, so this is, so here, this narrative where, you know, we may be thinking Matisse, but Matisse may have been thinking, you know, uh, Africa. And in fact, even in Chinese contemporary art, I have an artist from the 80s named Yuan Yun Sheng, who think when he was making painting in the early 80s, he was thinking he was making Picasso. He wanted to be the Chinese Picasso. But in fact, he was actually drawing images that looked like African art. And so I tell you, the world, and we, there's so much to learn and so much for us to uh, be more aware of. Um, I think that's significant. But I think um, each of your practices about fighting racism, fighting, you know, the, the system a little bit and making it more liberal is so significant. So I thank you. But maybe each of you, would you like to sh maybe a short minute uh, statement uh, to share with us? Uh, Mina, you want to go? Okay, I'll make it very brief. Um, this is very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, I still believe that being included is not enough. Um, 
I, and I appreciate the, the idea that leadership matters, mentoring matters. And, um, you know, the undoing aspect, the, you know, decolonizing is about undoing past histories. And, um, yeah, and I really appreciate um, all of you for kind of enlightening me in the ways which you did that. Thank you. And thank you, Ethan. Thank you. That's great. Um, Suzanne? Um, yeah. She, 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 um, one thing. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, one thing that concerns me is that um, a lot of the wave of anti-racism in art right now uh, followed the, the murder of George Floyd. And I've seen it in the past, maybe not as intensely when other prominent cases were in the news, like Trayvon Martin and uh, Eric Garner. But this is like a lifelong commitment. You know, it, it, it can't be just um, institutions like temporarily, temporarily having more artists of color included. It also involves you know, working on, especially, I especially um, am involved with, you know, organizing white people to, to like undo our racism. It's a lifelong thing. Um, I encourage people to look up undoing racism workshops by the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. And, you know, the art group I'm part of is, uses that as a foundation because we are all like gatekeepers at a certain level. And one thing we talk about is gatekeeping, you know, and, and gatekeeping is a big issue in the arts, just as, as Vinny and everyone was saying about who, whose art gets, you know, funded, whose art gets into museums and galleries and so on, who gets grants and fellowships, you know, racism is a big part of it in this country and it's ongoing lifetime work. Great. Thank you. Um, Annie? Is she here? Okay, okay. can we hear? Hold on. Okay. Well, hold on one second. Annie, one second. Unmute. Can you hear us? Hold on. Hold on a second. We're unmuting you. Is Annie unmuted? No, she's unmuted. You're unmuted, Annie. I'm, for some reason, can't hear you. We can't hear you. No. Can't hear her. No? Uh, well, what, okay, why don't we go then to Vinny and we'll get Annie on mute in a second. Go ahead, Annie. Go ahead, Vinny. Oh, I just, I just wanted to say that I enjoyed this. Uh, thank you for uh, including me. Uh, Suzanne, hi, I think I know you. I, I've met you somewhere before. Um, we're, thank yeah, you for Vinny, Vinny, we're Facebook, we're Facebook friends I, and I feel the longest yeah. time I've been wanting to meet you in person. We're both from Yonkers. You're yeah. living in Yonkers? Of course. Um, what I wanted to say was thank you for the band-aids. Uh, you made me look for them on eBay and I found some and I bought them. Uh, it hadn't occurred to me. That's how indoctrinated I am. I haven't even occurred to me that I needed colored band-aids. So thank you. Uh, you know, it's, it's a shame. It's so pervasive uh, that you don't even, you don't even think of things like band-aid colors being racist. You just kind of accept because you know, racism is just so normalized in this country. Yeah. Um, but what I want yeah. to uh, simply do is, you know, if indeed are there any artists watching this in the future, I just want to encourage them um, to think about art as art in public places as a career. Um, you know, new voices are needed, and um, you know, it's the kind of arena where it is sequestered, but. If your artwork is strong enough, if you have a really good A game, you can get in and make a difference. You know, you get to represent culture. You know, and we're talking about you know permanent, long-term artwork that makes a statement that can be affirmative, that can be um, you know fostering pluralism, and um, I just encourage you to try. So thanks for having me. Great. Well, great that you're here, all of you. Uh, Annie, can you can we hear you or you're uh, it may be on the horacious side. Somehow we're, uh, if you, we, what we can do is if you want to text me, uh, or write in the, uh, I can actually, uh, uh, read your, uh, share. 
But I think what's interesting, um, I'm sorry for the technical difficulty there. Um, uh, what was really interesting um, is what Mina said also, all you said, but what really struck me is being included is not enough. That really strikes a chord. Uh, and I think also what you said, um, um, Vinny, about new voices are needed. And uh, I think uh, it's a whole new platform. If you're an, what is, to, what is an artist of tomorrow? Or what is the artist of today and tomorrow? And how, how are people going to show up? and uh, be part of the conversation. And I think that uh, I thank you all for your contributions, what you're doing uh, for Annie, what you're doing with the prison systems, helping the incarcerated uh, uh, people and getting, being exposed to arts. Um, Suzanne, what you're fighting racism, all of us, I guess, are doing that. Mina and Vinny and your public art project. Vinny, that really, sh sh uh, really shocked me that when you think about uh, 5,600 public sculptures and only 5% are by women and less by minorities. That's just, that's not acceptable. That is not a reflection of America or, or a former America, but not of America today that it should be. So I think that we all have to evolve and um, we're part of the conversation. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Racist. Oh, and here, Annie, Annie's just shared with me a, a note here. I'm not sure why you can't hear me. But I wanted to say thank you to everyone and also to add that we can consider not only the art that is made, but the conditions in which the art is made. For example, for people who are incarcerated, to make art in those conditions is such a powerful experience. Mm. Thank you, Annie. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Horasis. Thank you, Frank um, Jurgen, for organizing this. And uh, you. congratulations to you all. Thanks. Let's all connect through Facebook. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much. So long. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.